I'd like to welcome you to a brief introduction to alkenes and alkynes. I'm Professor Davis from ChemSurvival.com and the YouTube channel ChemSurvival. And today we're going to talk about these types of compounds, alkenes and alkynes. We call these unsaturated hydrocarbons because they contain multiple bonds, either doubles or triples, which are highlighted here in yellow. And as we're about to see, that gives them some different properties and causes us to treat them a little bit differently when it comes to naming them. So let's talk about how we do that now. Let's begin by looking at the three simplest alkenes, or hydrocarbons containing a double bond. The simplest of all is ethylene, sometimes also called ethene. In this compound we have two carbons joined by a double bond and otherwise saturated with hydrogens. Adding an additional carbon gives us propylene. And adding one more gives us butylene, which actually has several structural isomers. The first of which is alpha-butylene, where the double bond is at the end of the molecule. And the second one is beta-butylene, where the double bond is in the middle. And if you study the structure of double bonds, you already know that free rotation is not possible within these bonds, which means it's also possible to have a stereoisomer called trans-beta-butylene, or cis-beta-butylene. Now these are the three simplest alkenes, and as you can see, having that fourth carbon there has already added a pretty good deal of complexity. But they all have similar chemical formulas. C2H4, C3H6, and C4H8. You'll notice that the ratio of hydrogens to carbons is unchanging in alkenes. That they're always CN, H2N. So this is our generic formula for alkenes. Now let's take a moment and look at alkynes, which are defined as hydrocarbons containing a carbon-carbon triple bond. The simplest of all alkynes is acetylene, which contains two carbon atoms joined by a triple bond. Now this is the very simplest of all, so the only things joined to the carbons are hydrogen atoms. If we add an additional carbon, we get methylacetylene which we call a terminal alkyne because the triple bonded carbons are at the end of the chain. You notice that there is one R group here in the form of a methyl highlighted in green and one hydrogen attached to the triple bonded carbons. Our next simple alkyne is dimethylacetylene and you'll notice that this would be called an internal alkyne because it contains two R groups, one bonded to each of the two alkyne carbons. So our alkynes have the formulas C2H2, C3H4, and C4H6. So they create a pattern which can be modeled as CnH2n minus 2. So as we're continuously removing hydrogens from our structures, making them less and less saturated, we go from alkanes to alkenes to alkynes. When the time comes to use IUPAC nomenclature for alkenes and alkynes, we have to take one very important thing into consideration, and that is that double and triple bonds are often the site of reactions in a molecule. And because of that, we give them a special designation as what we call functional groups. And we treat functional groups within a name a little bit differently than substituents. Let's take the example of our, uh, our ethylene. By IUPAC, we would call this molecule ethene. The eth prefix, of course, for having two carbons, and the ene -E suffix indicating that those carbons are joined by a double bond. A similar situation with a triple bond joining two carbons would be called ethine, the yne again indicating the presence of that triple bond functional group. Adding another carbon gives us propene, or in the case of a triple bond, propine. And when we bring a fourth carbon into the mix, we run into a situation where the location of the double bond or triple bond matters. Take the example of this butene molecule. The double bond in this molecule is on the end, starting with the first carbon. So we give it the name 1-butene or but1-ene to let our reader know that the double bond is on the end of the molecule. 
Now, a similar situation can arise with triple bonds. So here we have a four carbon compound with a triple bond. We would call this one butyne. The one designating the location of the triple bond at the end of the molecule. In contrast, if the double bond were in the middle of our four carbon molecule, we would call it two butene or butene, with the two indicating that it's the second carbon in the chain that initiates the double bond. And just as with our double bonds, we can have the same situation with the triple bond, where we have two butene because the triple bond starts with the second carbon in the chain. So this is the basic nomenclature system for alkenes and alkynes. Now let's consider what happens when we add even more carbons to the mix and branching becomes an issue. Now just as with alkanes, as we add more and more carbons to our alkenes and alkynes, the molecules become much more complex and we create a number of potential structural isomers, all of which we need to be able to distinguish from one another. And of course, memorizing a unique name for each one would take a tremendous amount of time. So instead, we're going to go to the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry once more for rules on naming these compounds unambiguously. Let's start with this compound here. Now, just as before, we're going to find the longest carbon chain within the molecule, but with one very important catch. It has to contain the double bonded carbons, or in this case, triple bonded carbons, because double and triple bonds are referred to as functional groups, not substituents. This is because they're usually the sites of reactions, so they get special priority, and one of those special priorities is they have to be in the continuous carbon chain that's defined as the parent. So in our case, this would be the longest carbon chain, a chain of six atoms. And it contains our alkyne triple bond, so we're good there. Next, we've got to catalog our substituents. And in this case, there's a single methyl substituent on my hexane molecule. The next step, of course, is to number my parent hydrocarbon so that I get the lowest possible numbers. But this time the lowest possible number has to go to the alkyne functional group. So the methyl group being a substituent is of lower priority. Now we can number from left to right where we get a two for the methyl group and the first carbon in our alkyne is a four. So this is a two four numbering scheme. And if we number from the other side, we end up with the alkyne as a two and the methyl as a five. So comparing a two and a four to a two and a five, you might be tempted to use the numbering scheme on top, but that would in fact be incorrect because it's the number of the alkyne functional group that matters. So this molecule would be five methyl, two hexyne. Let's try one more. How about this alkene? Well, just as before, we have to find the longest continuous carbon chain but it has to contain the functional group. So the longest continuous chain in the entire molecule doesn't actually contain the double bond. And therefore, we can't use this six-membered carbon chain. We're forced instead to use the five-membered chain because it contains the functional group. So this molecule would be called a pentene molecule. Using the defined parent hydrocarbon, we see a single substituent which would be an ethyl substituent because it has two carbons. And again, numbering my parent in such a way that my functional group gets the lowest possible number, I find that the first carbon in the double bond is a one and that the ethyl group is at carbon number two. So I would name this molecule 2-ethyl-1-pentene. The content of this micro lecture was an excerpt from a course I've been developing in collaboration with the teaching company. This course will be available in October 2014 and is 36 parts on organic chemistry. So whether you're a college student preparing for your next exam or a curious lifelong learner, find out more about my course at my website, www.chemsurvival.com. That's all for now, everyone. I'm Professor Davis. I'll see you on the next video.